your office probably has the biggest exposure point <laughs> of anybody in the county because you're on every gas pump. You're on every deli weighing do you, machine. Do you go to each one of those gas pumps and put that little sticker on there? I do not go personally, <laughs> but staff in the office do. Um, so, yeah, the weights and measures function. Right. But... Talk a little bit about that in regards to how to define a gallon as a gallon. I mean, what goes through that process? Or so a pound as a pound? One of the things we take a lot of pride in is our consumer protection division. Okay. Um, and weights and measures is a key component of that. Uh, has been fascinating to watch the team in action. Uh, when they do a gallon as a gallon, they, they pump. They've got a jug that's been calibrated to the state standards. Uh, it, it, there's a sealing process to even our jug. Um, but the team does a great job. They, they joke, I can't get it to stop at the right point. So <laughs> then they got to do the job all over again. We are looking forward our way from Studio C in the 511 Studios. This is Brett, and with me as always is Carol. How are you this morning? I'm good, Brett. How's it going? Good. All right. Good. So we're pretty excited with today's guest. You all know that um, many of us see government offices as a one-dimensional place to solve a problem. So transportation clears and builds roads, and needless to say, they've been busy here in Columbus for the last couple of months. Um, but human resources, employees, workers, courts take care of lawbreakers. Well, then I got to the auditor's website, and I have a whole new perspective on issues that have to be addressed to make our community stable and secure. Yeah, we found that the auditor's office has such varied areas of responsibility that I'm guessing many citizens, we figured as well, uh, they just don't understand the scope of work. Um, if uh, a citizen were to review the auditor's website, if you got some time, you're going to have the impression that every task not wanted by another agency was pushed into the auditor's lap. Um, however, when you filter through the details, the auditor is here to help each county resident in numerous ways, including maintaining the fiscal integrity of the county, its funds and reports, which is really important. Maintaining property value information on homes and businesses, which every one of us gets every year to take a look at what uh, our homes are supposedly valued at. Uh, maintaining a safe environment for a resident's dog, while also insurance items can be measured, whether it's gas in our cars or cigarettes purchased. And most importantly, maintaining vast quantities of information databases needed for safety, uh, securely and easily meeting the needs of the county. Yes, and and it is it it's um I have a whole new perspective <laughs> and <laughs> respect for our Franklin County Auditor Michael Stenziano who's joining us today. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. So, Auditor Stenziano, it's a nice long uh I'm I'm used to calling him Mike. So, <laughs> just, <laughs> this is tough. Um so uh, let let's first Share your background. Uh, tell us a little bit about what you've done, your path to the auditor's office, and then um, can you kind of like let us figure out how this organization works <laughs> and your responsibilities? You're the chief fiscal and measurement guy for the county. I am happy to talk about uh, all functions, <laughs> county auditor. Uh, I would agree that it did appear that when they were passing out duties and responsibilities, the auditors weren't in the room, and thus it all <laughs> exactly. fell to them. Miss a meeting. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. Tag, you're it. Yeah. Uh, so born in Columbus, uh, Mount Carmel West, uh, take a lot of pride in, in having been uh, born in Franklinton. Mom and dad had a place up in the hilltop. Boldly moved to the short north in the early 80s, which was right. unheard of for families to do, uh, and just really had a great childhood with Ohio State being my background uh, or backyard and uh, seeing uh, our community continue to grow. I did grow up in a political household. Uh, Dad was an elected uh, official on day one uh, when I was born, had, had already served in the General Assembly about six years. Uh, Mom worked for a state agency. And what I really share with folks that left the impression before Facebook, before Twitter, before podcasts, uh, dad gave out our home phone number. And so yes. at a very early age, uh, I would be the frontline constituent <laughs> intake person <laughs> if I was the first one to answer the phone. Title, so you, title, title. I, I always say, so you are the one I called. Is that it? <laughs> Occasionally. Um, and, and so having to be in a household and seeing the impact an elected official could have, uh, was really wonderful. And so that led, as I kind of thought through what I wanted to do in my future, uh, my first goal at 18 was to leave Ohio and never come back. So I went south to University of Richmond, uh, <laughs> go Spiders. But uh, knowing the 
ability to buy a home, uh, the opportunities that Central Ohio had as a growing community uh, really drew me back and mm-hmm. then starting a family. And so came back uh, for law school at Ohio State, uh, started working in then Secretary of State Jennifer Bruner's office uh, mm-hmm. doing election law, led to the opportunity to become director of the Frank County Board of Elections, uh, got to tackle the 08 presidential election, which sounds uh, – much different than what we experience now, and it was, but that was when the Board of Elections was still held quartered at the old COSI. Mm-hmm. We used Vets Memorial, the old Vets Memorial uh, as the early vote center, and we had record-breaking early votes and lines and lines and lines. Uh, but it was the first election in Ohio since 2000, 2004 that people uh, really were looking for accountability, uh, improving the experiences that voters had. And so the General Assembly had opened up a lot of laws. And really started down that path of what uh, access could mean, what could voting mean. Good quirk to Ohio law, though. You can't both run elections and run for office. So February 18th, 2010, resigned from the Board of Elections, turned around, came back in and filed paperwork to run for the then 25th House District. It was Central West Southern Franklin County. Um, Was successful, won with 100 percent of the vote because my opponent withdrew. Um, (laughs) You either run scared or run unopposed. Yeah, so it was go. a good moment. Take the win. It's a W. Uh, and then got to represent that district for two years. Found myself in a hyper, hyper gerrymandered situation. Uh, so they combined six other reps districts to form the newly created 18th House District. Uh, to put it in context, the 25th House District was about 120 square miles. The 18th House District was 22. They packed, packed, and packed uh, voters. Uh, but it was still the area that I had the largest portion, so while other uh, – and I lived in. Uh, and so was able to run for the 18th House District, uh, ran two more times, uh, but had the opportunity when Andy Ginther decided to leave Columbus City Council and run for mayor uh, to move to the local level. A lot of people wonder why would you go from the state to the local mm-hmm. Uh, at the state, representing about 120,000 people uh, in the city of Columbus, we're all at large, so gets represent 850,000. And I got to go back to that hilltop west side area that just because of a stroke of a pen, I no longer was representing. Right. And, and so that was really appealing and enjoyed the opportunity to be in a majority, tackle some of the city challenges, uh, bring kind of some of the things that I value in public service. So accessibility, giving people my cell phone number putting my email out there um, and working at the local level in that regard. But was approached about, what about the county? You can now represent 1.4 million people. Uh, And that was appealing. And having been uh, in the legislative branch of both the state house and council for eight years, opportunity to be a county executive position uh, was appealing. My own team, not having to kind of horse trade on votes, uh, follow my vision and agenda. And so been very fortunate. We're almost c- coming to our two-year anniversary on March 11th of serving as the Frank County Auditor. Um, hmm. You know, Mike, we have so many different ways that we've like uh, passed, either passed in the night, ships passing in the night, or or hit on, on topics. And uh, whenever anybody talks to me about networking, it's real easy to network in Columbus because we all have surrounded each other. So you had the advantage of having a wonderful mentor in your dad, um, who I placed interns with in one of my previous lifetimes. You worked with Judge Bruner. I worked with Judge Bruner and placing interns with her uh, when she was in Franklin County Court doing the um, the uh, uh, special docket program. And then City Council our age-friendly Columbus project that you spearheaded for us um, on city council, which was phenomenal. So, uh, and now I I have a whole new respect for your abilities with all of this stuff that you're doing. Well, I I mean, for being the 15th, hopefully eventually the 14th largest city, you're absolutely right in terms of the networking. Uh, My chief of staff in the auditor's office, I actually interned for her when I was in law school Wow, at the Ohio Supreme Court. And so those networks, that connection and the accessibility. I mean, that's what I really challenge when I'm talking to young people is if you have an idea of what you want to do or meet someone, just reach out to them. And both our city's values, our community's values. In all likelihood, they're going to be accessible because they had someone do that for them. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're really good. And it's it's not one side of the aisle or the other. We're all really good about helping each other Absolutely. in Columbus. And so that's great. Yeah. So wonderful. I, I, you know, looking at the auditor's website for real estate information, let's just get back to your job. <laughs> we all want to know <laughs> what our neighbors paid for their homes. So funny because I saw a listing of a neighbor just down the street, their home sold you know the dispatch list the pricing and i look at the number going 
wow, okay. Yeah, yeah. It has nothing to do with what you're printing, but the, the sale prices, you know, it's like, wow, okay. But, you know, your office provides information on the value of the home and the tax level we pay, including a, a three-year reevaluation of property values. The reevaluations likely cause confusion. I know they do for me uh, and, and concern by homeowners. However, um, your office has created services for property owners to better understand the process and how to appeal the results. But let's talk about that. And you, can you provide some information on property reevaluations, how you're making this complicated process a bit more transparent and equitable? Absolutely. So the property assessment function of the auditor's office is the one that's most well known. Uh, we have a statutory obligation under Ohio law. Uh, every six years to do a mass reappraisal where we go out and view each parcel. In a three-year increment of those six-year cycles, we do a triennial update. And it's not the uh, physical review. It's looking at real estate trends and values uh, in those communities. And so in 2020, that's what the Franklin County office uh, conducted. Uh, We had requested a one-year delay because we weren't sure the impact of the pandemic. That request was denied. Uh, didn't exist in the statute, as well as if you were looking at the sales, they continue to be very active. And so we performed our, our function. Uh, but the data uh, and, and the try or just generally presented on the website has an immense impact. It impacts people's pocketbooks. It impacts their communities. Uh, the way Ohio structures our school funding, those property taxes that are built off the values plus your taxing district – all trickle down. And so it's an uh, important role, but it's one the property owner has uh, a seat at the table and, and should be participating as actively as they want or not. And, and when I say as active as they want or not, when we did the triennial process, there was an opportunity for an informal review. So if you felt the value was too high or too low to come in and educate our appraisers, uh, and then we would take the information that was given. We don't go inside any homes. So uh, if ceilings are dipping or a kitchen hasn't been updated since the 50s. We won't know that unless the property owner shares it. Uh, and so the website doesn't always reflect that information unless it's been provided. Uh, after the try, if people still aren't satisfied or didn't think it was time to participate, then they go through the Board of Revision. And the Board of Revisions is a statutory entity made up of an auditor, treasurer, and the Board of County Commissioner representative. And again, it's a forum with a little more wiggle room to present why you feel the value is incorrect. By the time people are at the BOR, it's typically they want their value to go down. I I was just going to say you have the reverse. That's interesting. But I could see some scenarios. If you're likely going to be selling in the next year, you want the highest value listed on Mm -hmm. the website for whatever reason. The realtors are still going to come tell you this is what Uh, should be correct at this time. Um, Kind of of fooling yourself. Absolutely. People, oh, we're going to be selling. Can we get it higher? I said, Tell us why yeah, uh, and, and we'll conduct that. But through the BOR, again, it's that opportunity for that property owner to provide any information they feel is important. And it, it again, is a little more broader than the informal try review where it mm-hmm. is looking really at sales. And so encourage as much participation uh, as a property owner wants. But the challenge is how many people know about it? Are they intimidated by it? And because of the pandemic, what changes have we made? And so we have moved it all virtual. We've added a e-filing for the first time. So you can complete the entire process just through your computer. It'll make sure all the documents are filled out correctly. Uh, And if there is anything incorrect, you'll hear from the office so we can make sure we're we're capturing it. And and at the same time, wanting to make sure our entire community is participating. What was a a nuanced uh, thing that was counterintuitive for me was some of our opportunity neighborhoods see some of the larger value increases because it's a lot easier to flip a home that was 80,000 to get it to Mm 160,000 than it is to flip a $1.3 million home. You're not flipping a 1.3 and you're not going to see that, uh, that return on on investment at that percentage. Right. And and so we really want to encourage homeowners that are in those situations to participate. So we've created a, a uh, home buyer assistance program, uh, a free opportunity for low to moderate income property owners in Franklin County uh, to work with a legal aid society representative, both on their filing. So what will make a strong filing? And then if they continue to qualify, having representation at the different board of revision programs. Um, so trying to make it as accessible uh, and not both explaining the process, but also people going and taking advantage of the process. 
Yeah. Right. Uh, you know, I, I had an ulterior motive to have him here today because I don't live in Franklin County and I'm currently battling with my county auditor who managed over a 16-year period of time to only increase the value of my house $1,000 and the, the next year increased it by 30000 So I'm like, this makes no sense to me. Let's be transparent and oh my gosh, did I get a reaction? <laughs> I mean, so appraisal, as I've seen, is a little bit of art and a little bit of science. Yes. Uh, and then what also was very eye-opening was the role that the Department of Taxation at the state level plays. Right. So while we go through our entire training process, it ultimately gets approved at the state. Really? So okay. every county except Franklin uh, were asked to make changes to some of their valuations mm -hmm. uh, in the last cycle that participated. And in some cases, one county is suing uh, and saying we don't agree. Now, the the hammer for the state is they can withhold about 50 percent of the local government funding. Mm -hmm. uh, so that would be devastating in those communities if it right. doesn't come through. But, I mean, a lot of back and forth. Um, we understood we were a hot real estate market. We understood we were leading not only the state of Ohio, but in, in some portions of the country. Um, and, and so we knew it was a little sticker shock, but understood where it was coming from. And, mm -hmm. and we continue to work and improve both the data we're collecting and the explanation. Right. Uh, but really trying to get those appraisers to explain why did we make that determination? And before it was, well, it's a hot real estate market. It's like, we got to do better than that. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah. Exactly. And you really got to dig into it. And, and so the documentation uh, was something that our third party appraiser wasn't quite used to, uh, but we got there. Yes. Well, yes, because we've been a hot market for a long time. So that was my, you know, I'm like, well, if we were a hot market five years ago, why why is it now? You know, so it's it's been an interesting process. But so this kind of get, gets to my next question, too, is you can't control the market, but you can help st stabilize it, help strengthen it. Absolutely. Um, in terms of representing what the sales are and, and what the right balance is. So the appraised mm -hmm. value, again, is one piece of then the taxing district, which gets us to the property taxes, which what people are really concerned about. Um, and, and so we are looking at the trends. Uh, if things need to be held flat or if there aren't the investments that are reflected in other areas, the office can uh, have a say and, a, and a, put their thumb a little bit in, in that direction. Uh, we really broke down to make sure we were doing a better job of creating what we refer to as trainial neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So appraising the right sections. A lot of the feedback we heard coming into the new administration where I was being compared to properties that were out of bounds. And right. that's where I was seeing value increases. And so we added about 200 new appraised uh, neighborhoods. So oh, really focused on a micro level to capture the right features, land grade, uh, school district. Uh, it, it, there's a whole science behind that sure. piece of the appraisal. Sure. Oh, good. So how many, can I ask, how many are you now up to in terms We're of those numbers? about 425. So you almost doubled it. We did. Oh, that's yeah. phenomenal. Because I, that's exactly what I'm seeing in my in my area. You know, it, uh, it, to, to, to take a condominium association and compare it to the McMansions down the road make no sense. Right. And that's what we, we're experiencing. Uh, I'll use Upper Arlington as the example. We got a lot of feedback from Upper Arlington folks that depending on what street you're on, there is a big difference Huge. in the real yes. estate value. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And so they were all being lumped together. Uh, we really took pen to paper uh, and were able to use investments in technology uh, to create better boundaries and reflect and part of that justification when people say, well, why did my value go up? We said, this is the cranial neighborhood and the sales we looked at. Uh, encourage them if there's other sales or if they think there's mm -hmm. other properties that are better uh, to submit that with to us as well. Right. Great. Good. Okay. Well, our community is reeling from inequities and division throughout all the sectors. One very important issue that created incredible discrimination in many communities was, was that historic redlining. Uh, can you give us some of the history on this practice and how your office can support communities and ensure it does not continue to occur? So one of the things when we came into the office we were committed to was doing a performance audit at the mass appraisal. And whether or not some of the systematic redlining or uh, – changes of our community have impacted values. We can see based on zip code pretty clearly 
uh, mm-hmm. that uh, wealth within those communities aren't being uh, gained at the same rate. At the same time, it, some properties are the exact same buildings are being valued drastically different. And the explanation, well, it's just real estate. It's location, location, location. Well, is it? And so we've partnered with the Kerwin Institute uh, at Ohio State to really dive into the role redlining in our community has played in setting valuations and then how it's kind of built off of that. Right. Um, so a lot of other uh, colleagues have challenged, well, you know, the numbers are the numbers, and that's all we're looking at. And that redlining doesn't play a role. But when you kind of see where it was implemented, it absolutely has. And so we continue to work with that lens in mind as we do our evaluations, trying to make it equal. The catch and what we don't want to see in some communities, uh, Detroit, for example, when they got caught up, it shot up in some of those opportunity neighborhoods, the values. And we don't want to then all of a sudden be creating a weird dichotomy of, you know, you were wronged. We're trying to right it. But now you're being asked to pay property taxes that just right, are so out of whack. Right, right. And so trying to balance those interests out. Uh, in Michigan, though, there's a cap of how much your property taxes can go up. We don't have that in Ohio. Yes. Um, so that something like be. that would be helpful. Right. Um, but we, we are working very hard to make sure it's equitable and a fair process, uh, recognizing and, and being really to tell that redlining story. Kerwin has done a fantastic job. Uh, we've got a couple YouTube videos through the, uh, on the auditor's website uh, that walks through very uh, systematically of kind of how this has occurred over time and it, where that impact is played and pri- and pricing property values. Yeah. Well, it, I grew up in Linden. My parents grew up in Milo. I mean, you want to talk about redlining. Uh, those neighborhoods were just decimated. Um, I remember 71 being built right next to my aunt's house. You want to talk about loss of value of a house. Um, with a with a freeway going in next door. Yeah, just look at the difference between Clintonville and Linden. Exactly. And, and the, mm-hmm. A highway went through the middle of it, and, and that just drastically impacted absolutely uh, the values. Uh, yes, location, location, location is a great real estate term, uh, but for our community, and again, the role that housing can play in helping build family wealth uh, and personal wealth uh, is something personally I think should continue to be shared. Uh, it's a good equitable uh, way, and we want to see those investments continue to grow right. and not be because of the stroke of a pen or systematic racism's right. role in some of what had occurred in the past continuing. Well, and it's and it's not just the value of a property per se, but it's a person's ability to get a loan to buy that. that right. I mean, as a single female, I, I literally had to threaten <laughs> the guys to, like, approve my loan. There is no reason in the world that I can't be approved for a loan. But as a single female, I was being discriminated against. Yeah, and we are looking at other ways in which we can improve within our community. Right. Uh, the challenge of someone that wants to maybe buy a parcel that's $120,000, we want to get more homeowners than renters in our community. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and so how we can do that. And it's getting that bank loan. That's one of the biggest exactly. uh, challenges just to get in that first wave of mm-hmm. either a starter home or st- stable place within a school district they're looking for. Right, right. Mm. So you had mentioned just a bit ago about um, state policies. Yes, we would love to have, in case any of those legislators are listening, we'd like to have a cap. Um, your office released policy priorities for 2021. I was fascinated. Had that been something that the auditor's office had done in the past, or is this something that you brought in? I I, I don't think they've been as blatant. I, I know okay. previous administrations have worked either through the Auditors Association or through their own personal policy preferences. Um, but some of the staff we brought in, my legislative background, knowing these are areas that need to be improved uh, and trying to be ahead of it and help lead to get not only the Franklin County delegation, but ultimately the Good laws passed uh, was a goal. Right. And it's not just a, a limit on for taxes for seniors, but um, you're looking at the veterans of the disabled who could, as you said, they can't suddenly take this huge leap on on taxes. Um, some of the other things were, you know, local control on um, approval of large tax incentives, the Tax Incentive Review Council. Can you give us a little bit of an overview of where you're trying to go? With yeah, so sure. So now we're really getting into that, uh, the website the and all the, the many, many things uh, that we do. So I'll start with the Turk. 
the county auditors serve as the statutory chair of the Tax Incentive Review Commission. So every jurisdiction in our community that gives out a tax abatement or a TIF, so um, we then review it. But all we do is look at it, say, okay, it's meeting the rules or not, and then make a recommendation to their local uh, body. Mm -hmm. Uh, We would like to evolve that to a Turk with teeth so we are better able to, A, capture equal information. Uh, Last year we had 21 different Turk meetings, uh, 17 uh, were pretty consistent in the information, and then five they just said, well, we're meeting the statutory uh, standard but we're not going to really help with additional information. And in some cases, the information isn't good. We as a Turk would probably suggest drastic changes to those economic incentives because those are deferring taxes that other property owners then have to help make up the difference in. Uh, so Turk with teeth is a, a good goal. Um, on the property piece, uh, along with property values, uh, our role with helping set the taxing rate um, the state does have a homestead exemption a disability exemption uh, that has not been I think as realized as was originally mm-hmm. intended uh, when the governor made some changes and this was governor Kasich adding a economic component along with an age component to qualify for the homestead exemption uh, it wasn't tied to inflation so the vast majority of applicants that qualify are ones that were grandfathered in before that change. The program is not growing. Now, the state backfills that money. Um, and, and so I think it was a budget decision when we were down to a rainy day budget of 70 cents. Uh, but mm-hmm. we're, we're much better fiscal position now. And, and as a older growing population of Ohioans, uh, homestead needs to be improved and, and be mm-hmm. a little m- more of an access because – particularly in Franklin County, uh, we're a very generous community when uh, entities go to the ballot uh, and we just approved a bond issue for Columbus State. That is an additional property tax uh, component or a a piece of your property tax. And so that is going to impact particularly older residents' ability to continue to stay in their home. And, And the worst thing we hear are people feeling or being property taxed out of the place that they have put so much into the over time, decades and generations. Right. And and a, a lot of times folks who are voting don't remember that they're voting for a tax that they don't have to pay, um, that it's property owners paying and they may not be a property owner. So it's... Yeah. I mean, so with COVID in particular, mm-hmm. um, I don't think a lot of people thought about the Columbus State bond issue uh, with the primary, got delayed, gets passed, but now it's showing up on people's property tax bill. And it's not... Uh, always substantial, but if you're on a fixed income, any dollar mm-hmm. has an impact. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, we're getting a lot of questions of, you know, the majority of my property taxes go to paying for schools. Schools aren't meeting in person. What am I paying for? Uh, right. And so that continue uh, consideration of what we're willing to support and then how it plays itself out, then tied to the value, all comes to a head every day in the auditor's I'll office. Bet. Yes. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Your office probably has the biggest exposure point <laughs> of anybody in the county because you're on every gas pump. You're on every deli weighing do you, machine. Do you go to each one of those gas pumps and put that little sticker on there? I do not go personally, <laughs> but staff in the office do. Um, so, yeah, the weights and measures function. Right. But Talk a little bit about that in regards to how to define a gallon as a gallon. I mean, what goes through that process? Or so a pound is a pound. One of the things we take a lot of pride in is our consumer protection division. Okay. Um, and weights and measures is a key component of that. It mm-hmm. uh, has been fascinating to watch the team in action. Uh, when they do a gallon as a gallon, they they pump. They've got a jug that's been calibrated to the state standards. Uh, it, it There's a sealing process to even our jug. Um, but the team does a great job. They, they joke, I can't get it to stop at the right point. So <laughs> then they got to do the job all over again. Um, but then on the scales. That stop just cost us $100, guys. Get the gallon right. You know? uh, <laughs> on the scales, it is truly putting a 10-pound weight and making sure the scale says 10 pounds. But it, it's shocking over time. They wear down. Uh, right. They need to be recalibrated. Uh, but it's been a great opportunity to work with local businesses, uh, mom and pop shops, uh, they're very welcoming. And, and then giving that assurance to uh, people that purchase or engage uh, that, yes, this is meeting the standards and, and you're that not you don't being have the off. heavy thumb 
right. butcher. Right. right. <laughs> but yes, the, <laughs> you know, the, the stickers the show up gone. a lot. Yeah. What is unique, though, you'll be able to tell if you're in Franklin County or the city of Columbus. City of Columbus has its own weights and measures team. Okay. And so occasionally okay. you will find city of Columbus stickers. Interesting. Um, I would is. never have. <laughs> so the history of that, uh, the city charges to do their inspections. Of course. And so... <laughs> Uh, it was meant to be a revenue generator at right. some level. It, it hasn't quite equated to that. Um, it, but over time, they've really been proud of their division as well. Uh, but that's how you know where you are, uh, particularly around, say, Grandview Heights, 5th by Northwest. If, right, if it's right. a City of Columbus sticker, you're actually in the City of Columbus, not not in Grandview. Okay. Right. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> uh, Goodness gracious. Hmm. So, But in terms of all that work that you've done, it's been very, very successful. You've you've had almost no complaints. We have a great team. Uh, complaints do come up, and, and they respond quickly. Um, and, right. and so appreciate both their uh, commitment to that consumer protection, but they have a lot of fun with it. I mean, they <laughs> a, a great story. So we are monthly highlighting a, a local business, and, and we call that our True Transaction Award. Uh, we found ourselves last week in Urban Crest at the Tropical Nuts and Candy Factory. <laughs> It was amazing and never knew it was that down there. It is a yeah. very cool place. It, it is. Yeah. And they are at, uh, I yeah. want to say, Walgreens mm-hmm. across the country, 150 employees running three shifts six days a week. Do they have like a gift shop? They do. <gasps> yeah. Next Christmas. They do. Yeah, because I remember them being in, a, I think, a different location of one time when I found them. I think they've moved. But so that's so cool. I yeah. think when it started, she, the president mentioned they were in Grandview at mm-hmm. one point, or mm-hmm. Worthington. It was yeah. in Worthington, yeah, at, Worthington at one point. Worthington. Around Bush Boulevard area, moved, that sort yeah, of thing. Yeah. And then yeah. moved oh, into yeah, this yeah. giant factory. But you don't, you wouldn't know. <laughs> and I've been to Urban Crest a lot of times, down in Grove City. Who knew? Yeah. Uh, but uh, the Weights and Measures team uh, helps us identify those good partners. That's cool. Um, and so got to leave with a lot of chocolate pretzels. So. Yeah. No, no, no yeah. downfall of that. Yeah. A lot of people in the office wanted those returned, <laughs> which we did. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a job to have. Goodness. Yeah. Well, so when, when I was doing this deep dive into your website and continually surprised at everything that was involved, I don't know why I was surprised. You're the auditor. Why was I surprised that you have to look over the money for Franklin County? I don't know. But that, it, you know, do the commissioners call you and say, Mike, is there any money? <laughs> yes and no. Uh, so I'm very popular in that my name is on all the paychecks. Oh, yes. uh, and, and so with that fiscal <laughs> officer responsibility, that was one of the two things when I came into the office, another auditor said, you can't screw up. Payroll always has to get out and get out on time. Oh, yeah. Oh, and yes. uh, not that we've had close calls, but occasionally <laughs> – technological systems malfunction and then right. we are making sure we meet <laughs> that oh, yes. standard. Oh, yes. Um, but work well with the commissioners. They also have their own department of office and management. Mm-hmm. And so we work closely with them. Uh, we produce uh, the statutory requirement documents. So the CAFR and PAFR, uh, and they play a role in making sure that we have sound uh, fiscal standing, uh, particularly when then the county or the treasurer go out for some bonding issues um, so it, it's an interesting system uh, between the treasurer, office management budget, and the auditor's office. But we all work really well together um, to the credit of the team on the fiscal side. Uh, they continue to uh, receive recognition from the state auditor and, and really do a wonderful job uh, with their diligence uh, and standards of not only the auditor's office, but working with other county agencies as well. Mm-hmm. Great. Yeah. Okay. Well, another piece is the catch-all bucket is the, the dog's. And, and you know, our home is the dog haven. I mean, I'm at your doorstep every year with the dog license for our dog, Miles. Um, so why does the auditor deal with licenses for dogs, kennels, breeders, vendors, cigarettes? Now, that got jumped in there. Uh, junkyards. And, and also, um, why just dogs and not cats and exotic animals? Again, I'm convinced the auditors weren't in the room. I think, <laughs> um, yeah. So it's statutory requirement. Okay. Uh, if the General Assembly came and said we need to license cats – or gerbils, we would do it. You would do um, it. I, I, no one has ever really explained the history. There mm-hmm. is a public health component of why they wanted dogs licensed. Um, why it didn't fall through public health at the time, unclear. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that, Was that a rabies issue? It, it used to be huge. So in Franklin County, we require a rabies tag. We're the only county mm-hmm. that also requires that. But just generally why they went through and desired oh, licensing okay. was, I think, the rabies. But some – it was uh, – 
up to the discretion of each county if they wanted to add that additional rabies requirement. Okay. Uh, hmm. But it, it, it is a very important role, one that's very popular. Uh, the funding of the dog license goes to the animal shelter, and, and so they're great partners as well. But it, it, it's quirk, and yeah. that department, as you also mentioned, does cigarette licenses and business licenses when they arise as well. And, and so it's just kind of the licensing function right. uh, that – I inherited, I assume it started with more of the business licensing and they said, well, they're already licensing one thing, give them the dogs. Kind of the processes right. that you already were kind of taking care of. They understand that process, give it to them. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, and it was done at uh, pre-technology, needless to say. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it, if, you, if you've got the name of every person in the county to start with, that's a place to start. So. Yeah, and, and mm-hmm. they, to your point on the technology, they just got rid of the stamper. So they would take each dog tag, roll a number, and pound it out. Oh uh, we don't gosh. have to do that anymore. But oh. that is something that changed in the last three years. Um, in other counties, they're still doing it that way as, as well. Um, and so it, it, that's what's fun about the job yeah. is just the depth and breadth. Uh, we absolutely touch everyone's lives uh, in yeah. some shape, way, or form every day uh, across the county. And, and so, uh, take a lot of pride with the dog licenses. We're not at the numbers we want. We're only about 30% of dog owners are getting licensed in Franklin really? County. Really? Oh my yeah, gosh. I, it, lack of awareness. People don't realize they need to do it until the dog's missing. And then the first question is, well, was your dog licensed? And then you find out pretty fast. Uh, the cost is prohibitive for some folks and, and the way the statute is written it's one of our priorities this year of trying to get a little more flexibility mm-hmm. uh, we've got situations where people want to donate uh, additional fees to help buy other low-income licenses and, nice. and it's not clear how we can do that i've also had very frustrating situations where someone took the time got licensed and unfortunately the dog passed away two weeks later so now we, we just have a license that's not being maximized so could we uh, allow them to wait till they get another dog and carry it forward, or could they gift that license over? Just mm. the the shelter's been very open to ideas, and now it's got to get the general assembly on board. Right? Interesting. Yeah. I, I mean, that's come kind of stop me from doing the multiple year. Again, you know, okay, you never know when your dog's going to pass away and such. So I'll yeah. do it year to year, but I hadn't thought about that. You know, maybe. I guess it's at that for us at that price point that it's like, okay, if he were to pass away a couple of months within the license, okay, it's not a big deal. Right. But I understand if you have multiple dogs, it oh, can yeah. be costly if they're not neutered or spayed. That's an increase in price of the of the tag, um, as as well as you know, uh, you know, gifting it. That's a really good idea. I like that uh, Did, potentially. Am I on the wrong track here? Did I see something where you could buy a license for the life of the dog? So about five years ago. The General Assembly and their infinite wisdom created a annual, so one year, a three-year, or a lifetime license. Okay. All right. Uh, the price point's the same other than the lifetime's a 12-year uh, range. Uh, so annual is the same price as 12 if you have the, the, the canine for 12 years. The only dis- difference is if you get a three or a lifetime, you won't get as much mail from me because uh, we won't send the annual reminders wow. over and over again. Uh, to get it licensed. There, there's a reason to uh... – <laughs> It's kind of like voting. The earlier you vote, the less <laughs> campaign stuff you're going to get true. closer yeah. to election yeah. day. Very yeah. true. Makes Very sense. true. Makes okay. So let, let's step back a second on taxes again. And we sort of touched on this just a little bit. But, um, you know, people get really upset when they hear abatements that folks have – not have don't have to pay for their company to come in and buy a building and hire a bunch of people because they're going to bring in other taxes, other income taxes. So it, I, you don't you really have to react to that, correct? Your your office has nothing to do with it in terms of the decision making. You have to react and watch over it. Are there some things that you're thinking about that could strengthen? Abatement, so they're not just they don't aren't seen just as a gift to companies. So this goes back to that Turk uh, right. duty and responsibility. Right. And you're right, we react. So uh, a municipality, we'll say New Albany, uh, wants to attract a, a Facebook mm-hmm. data center. Uh, they decide this is the program. Uh, these are the abatements. This is what's going to be uh, approved to get them here, and, and they come. Uh, then we take the time and review it. What we've heard a lot is the need to get more of that information available. Mm -hmm. Uh, Previous administrations did do a essentially an economic impact of abatements. The conclusion was it was actually saving at the end of the day, taxpayer dollars. Uh, But we want to have that review done annually. Uh, We're also trying to create a, uh, 
customer friendly tool. So anyone can go in, enter, uh, first learn about it, but then also enter the data and make their own conclusions of is this a benefit or not. Uh, and so we've worked uh, with some regional economists uh, on creating that tool, uh, but they're complicated. And uh, again, it goes back to making sure we've got the correct information through the Turk so that we can present it and make it available. Right. Uh, so while we will never be the ones driving that municipality's decision, that, that is up to their elected office holders, uh, because we get so many questions and the desire to have that data in a way that is uh, – equitable and digestible. That's really what we continue to work on. And unfortunately, what you see in the paper is when it falls through, when a company gets an abatement and then they close down and they didn't hit or or they only hit 100 people and not the 150 they promised or whatever. You know, and there are lots of reasons that could be good reasons that they didn't quite make their part of the abatement. But having more information could, uh, even if they didn't hit 150, if they hit 100 and it brought in a lot more payroll income than property income, then, you know, why not? Yeah. And, and, and the Turks, the place to kind of have those reviews in 21 mm-hmm. meetings last year, I think two members of the public came. Uh, so there's somewhat right. a, a lack of awareness of a Turk. Uh, and then there's lack of awareness just of these projects and the annual review that occurs uh, in all the different jurisdictions. And last year you could have zoomed into all the meetings. Uh, right. It couldn't have been any easier and right. had, I, I, for as much uh, concern and understandably for tax abatements across mm-hmm. our community, not seeing the public being more engaged in those meetings has been a little bit of a surprise. But well, oh, so let's let's go with that. Yeah. Uh, the public involvement. How does one prepare to be a part? Okay, let's, we can zoom in. Is is the meeting understandable? How do you prepare for a meeting so, to know to, to get the information you want out of it? Right. And that's one of our challenges. We need to get that information out there uh, sooner. Okay. Uh, when we inherited was a system of some of the jurisdictions were just providing the information the day of the meeting. Okay. Uh, we're asking them to give it to us two weeks ahead. We post it as part of the public notice where we have it. Still mm-hmm. not required. Mm-hmm. Uh, we do have a lot of great partners, but some – Municipalities say it's not required, so we're not going to provide it mm-hmm. uh, until you until you need it, or we're going to do it to the the, the to the law. Mm-hmm. Um, but to that point, we're hoping with the website and the information we're going to be putting out later this year, just that awareness. So, okay, that's that project. Let's keep track and watch it a little bit more. I think that will help okay. have people more prepared, understand what's going on, and see if they're meeting uh, what that commitment was when it was originally granted. Okay. How how do people find out about those, the Turk meetings? Uh, we publicly notice them. Uh, okay. We don't do it as part of our newsletter, although I think people will see this year a greater uh, push of Turks are coming up. This is what they are. Uh, and then we last year we put out our first annual Turk report. That will be continued along with the tool. So I think part of our commitment in our less than two years that we've been there is trying to draw bigger awareness and right. recognition that these are occurring. I guess because I'm, if I was sitting in New Albany and they they were talking abatement, I would be thinking of how do I find information from New Albany. It wouldn't have dawned on me to have gone to your office information to find out when it was going to be under discussion. Right. So yeah, okay, absolutely an area where the auditor's office can do more and better. Well, it you know I I don't. I'm not saying that. I just think it's I am. really. No, but I, I just Somebody's think it's been put really. On notice with that, right? Yeah, now. really. really no. No, it's just such a confusing yes. and multi-level, multi-touch point issue that Brett and I were talking about. This, you know, how do you find places to send the podcast information? It's just, I mean, the internet makes it crazy. Yeah. yeah. And, and to your point that someone's unnoticed, we brought hired a, a new member for the office focused solely on Turk and tax incentives. Mm-hmm. So Lane is well aware of what the standard sure. and duty is. Sorry, and Lane. He's doing, no, Lane's, <laughs> Lane's a rock star. He's doing okay. great. We are very lucky to have him. Well, and, and it's, yeah, that, I mean, that's, I, I have since the last set of elections that we've gone through have said people need to educate themselves. We had a great podcast about that. If you don't educate yourself on how your government works, don't sit there and say it's not working. Yeah, and one thing the office also does, we put out a a tax calculator. Uh, Mm -hmm. We send out something that we call the value of your vote postcard notice. So if there's going to be a bond or levy issue uh, that is going to impact your property taxes, uh, we 
proactively send that out. Uh, we've added more because of my background in elections, notification of when the election is, any other information that may be helpful. Uh, participation in that continues to be varied as well, though. Uh, but that's where then – Five months later, people are upset about their property tax bill. Exactly. They had a direct opportunity to participate or uh, ask questions then that were going to impact that property tax right. bill. Yeah. I, I remember several years ago, I uh, contacted somebody at my county's board of elections and said, why isn't the date of the election on your website? You have to put down the date of the election in on a, a application for an absentee, absentee. ballot. Right. But you can't find the date of the election and you're afraid to guess. And so it's, it's kind of interesting. So now it, it is up there. So sure. thank goodness. Yeah. Well, this may continue on with what we just talked about. You know, we noticed that your community outreach program provides residents with some great information on the issues of the day or items to be aware of, such as fraudulent check scams. Uh, recently, your office reported it was returning funds to local cities and school districts here in Franklin County. Uh, close to three point five million dollars uh, was that savings your office created, and how? I mean, what's the story? So, in the creation of uh, Ohio law in auditor's office, maybe this is why we're willing to take on all these duties. Uh, a portion of bonds or levies comes directly to our office, and so depending on the office's philosophy or approach, you can not return that money, or you can. I think. Those are the school district's dollars. Those are the library's dollars. Uh, so while we will perform the functions we need to, it's more important for them to get that return. And so uh, the commitment is we do it annually. Uh, the odd, previous administrations have done it every four years, likely an election year. Um, but we are trying to make that commitment. Uh, and so, yes, we are very uh, sensitive to being good stewards of taxpayer dollars, uh, making sure we are creating savings where we can. And we've seen that, uh, but it's also just the annual commitment to make sure that this money gets returned as quickly as possible. So where would it have lived if it didn't go back? We, we've we got a line item in the county level okay. and it just kind of accrues, accrues, accrues. Um, and, wow. and so, yeah, wow. yeah it, it's, it, it's a, an interesting quirk for auditor's offices uh, not every county is in as good a position as well, and so other auditors aren't able to do that. Yeah. Uh, it really is a county by county uh, decision and opportunity. Wow, that's, that's wonderful. Which kind of brings up another um, piece of the puzzle that may not be in your lap. So, although you watch over the money from the county, you're not investing the money of the county. No, that is the county treasurer. Yeah, uh, so I, it didn't. Do, I, that just hit me when you were talking about bonds. Well, that's one thing you don't have to do. <laughs> there you go. But we work closely with them. Um, as long as it's in their bailiwick, though, right? <laughs> it's a good partnership. But it, it, we had just talked to a local bank uh, yesterday, kind of talking about the quiet period they're in. They're looking in the treasurer's office to maybe uh, reassign the contract. And so just trying to learn as much as they can of what's going on and what we do wow. in that process. So it's 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 interesting uh well, when, System. Yeah, when mm -hmm. when the market goes up, they probably are, you know, everybody's favorite treasurer. But boy, when the market goes down, <laughs> I wouldn't want to be in their spot. Yeah. So um, we, we talked about tech a little bit. Um, your office has lots of tech going on. And again, another surprise, you are you you have to deal with a lot of the data and information um, for the county. So, so another one of those, I'm not sure where the auditor was when the General Assembly created <laughs> it. Uh, I serve as the statutory chair of the uh, data center. So some counties have local data centers. It is kind of uh, from yesteryears. Uh, when they were trying to figure out what is this technology and, and mm -hmm. how are we going to build it. So it's myself, a representative from uh, the court, uh, the clerk of court, Mary Ellen O'Shaughnessy, the treasurer, the board of elections, um, the recorder's office, and board of commissioners. So the board's pretty substantial, but the auditor, when things are going bad, is the one that takes all the heat for it. Right. So I get to be the chair. Um, but it, it's a great opportunity, aligns really well with my passions of trying to make technology uh, improve government services. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a wonderful CFO, um, and he really has done a great job of aligning not only our mission to bring Franklin County into the 21st century, but working with different agencies on what mm -hmm. their needs are. Um, absolutely doing a lot of cost savings because of that approach. 
uh, but we still have a long way to go. Well, it given the responsibilities you have on the other kinds of things, having the database to your is probably to your advantage as opposed to being um, dealing with another office doing that job. I, 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 we, I, I would say we get treated a little bit the same as all the other offices oh, and, and where we do have priorities uh, depending on what the mission of the agency is. Uh, we may have to fall back a little bit. But, oh. yes, I, I do get to have uh, the CFO's cell phone number in case yes. something comes up. But we have a great relationship. He came in uh, as part of our administration and so has brought wonderful stability, has a great team. And, again, I think really positioning uh, – well, the data center, not only for a county, but in partnering uh, with the city of Columbus on some initiatives. Mm -hmm. And so it's going to be things like body cameras for the sheriff's office that arose this summer um, that they weren't required. The county commissioners made that investment and now will fall into a data area. And so the oh, data wow. board will be part of that discussion. And so – Yes, auditor functions are important, but so are supporting and making sure mm -hmm. we're aligning everyone across the county the same on the data center piece. Great. Okay. Mm. So unclaimed funds, who doesn't look through that list of names? I do. Just if your name might pop on it and such. Every I mean, year. <laughs> so let's talk about that. How does that – what is this? And, you know, there's some really great success stories, I guess you could say, that, that they didn't realize. That they Sadly, had. I don't have any really okay. great get rich stories. Yeah. Darn. Um, but it is entities or ind property owners, taxpayers that engage with the county uh, and different functions owed money okay. and for whatever reason did not claim it. And so we mm -hmm. are statutorily required to put out the list. Um, we also put out a delinquent tax list, not as popular. Mm. <laughs> uh, I don't look at that one. <laughs> but it, it, it that, that's really just making sure that we aren't claiming money that really isn't ours as a government entity. Is there a timetable on that, that once you realize there's unclaimed funds, is there a clock that starts? Not really. For, really? It, it, wow. There really is a process to always get it back. Oh, really? Okay. Mm -hmm. Wow. Got to fill out some forms. Yeah. Um, of course. But yes. it, 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 well, and, it yeah, wow. put the list out. Yeah. If I remember correctly, I'm not – I mean, there's there's only one unclaimed funds for each county. Correct. So when I was the director of the agency, I had to fill out a form saying we don't have any unclaimed funds. So even if oh, okay. we didn't have any, we still had to report it as a – so, for instance, if somebody had um, paid for a program and and didn't get a – uh, didn't get the money back when they didn't, you know, come to the program. Sure. I would. It could have been unclaimed funds. We didn't charge for anything, so we didn't have any unclaimed funds. So, hmm. yeah, yeah, but, they just kind of trickle out there. That's interesting. So I, wow. uh, yeah, and I do watch that list. So. <laughs> but I'm glad to hear you also <laughs> don't aren't worried about delinquent tax list. <laughs> oh no. No no no, 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 I, I that one scares me more than unclaimed <laughs> I <was> funds. <laughs> Yeah, no, we uh, do not want to go there. No. So, uh, you know, Mike, we we have we I did not want to make this confu a confusing conversation, but it was kind of hard to sort of get through all of the different pieces of the auditor's office. So, you know, sort of in retrospect, what is there any message that you want to make sure that, that folks hear? Yeah, I, I, the commitment that started day one that I learned in my household of giving out that uh, phone number, uh, we're here to serve the public. And so if there's any questions, concerns on, on any function, not only the auditors, but others uh, across the county, uh, we want to be accessible. And so mm -hmm. encourage uh, anyone listening or going to the website, feel free to email me, Auditor Stenziano, FranklinCountyOhio.gov. Feel free to call my cell anytime, 614-219-9224. I don't even um, give my cell phone I, <laughs> to the office. It was, so it, it scares the staff to death. I bet. Because they know if they're not happy, he's probably going to get a call on a yes, cell phone. Yes. It's a burner phone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that, that we're here to, to provide those services. And, and given those different experiences that I shared in the bio of being at the state level and at the city level, we have good partners and are able to help get you – maybe through some of the malaise that people have experienced before. Right. And so even if it doesn't fall or feels mundane about, you know, my dog's rabies situation, mm -hmm. let us know. Uh, we've heard it all for the most mm -hmm. part uh, and look forward to anything new that we haven't heard before. Right. Uh, well, and, and if the listener is not in Franklin County, this information is likely 
pretty close to what everybody is doing. And in our show notes, I've got information on how to check on other counties in the state, um, the state auditor's office and information there. So just, um, again, it, you know, if you've got a question, educate yourself, and that may that process may be the first step is calling your office. And we look forward to it. Wonderful. Thank you so much yeah, for joining us you. today. Yes, this yeah. was great.